It was a series of senseless killings that left the whole of France stunned. When 24-year-old Thierry Paulin was apprehended on the 1st of December 1987, he admitted to the murder of at least 21 helpless elderly women. In a series of killing sprees across three years, Paulin, a thief, left behind no witnesses at his crime scenes as he brutally strangled his victims to death. Detectives Jean-Claude Moulet and Claude Peroni had the task of bringing Paulin to justice. We were under immense pressure. The only thing we were afraid of was being on call. In other words, would a phone call wake us up that night? Headquarters calling us about a case, telling us about the killing of an old lady. We dreaded finding more victims every time. Paulin n'est pas un tueur en série. C'est un tueur en chaîne. Le tueur en série est un tueur pathologique. Paulin was not a serial killer. He was a spree killer. A serial killer is a pathological killer who kills to experience a physical or moral pleasure. In other words, he enjoys a terror he inspires in others. The spree killer is different. Paulin was a born criminal. In inverted commas, he was complete riffraff. Attacking a grandmother is a triumph without peril which brings no glory. Attaquer une grand-mère, hein? À vaincre sans péril, on triomphe sans gloire. In a twist of fate, Paulin himself would be dead before the trial of his accomplice, Jean Thierry Maturin, in December 1991. Philippe Bilger was prosecuting. Paulin escaped the trial. Unfortunately, it was AIDS that killed him. And of course, we can lament the fact that the mastermind, the instigator, was never brought to justice. This much is clear. Forgive me for being crude, but the criminal justice system took what was left. In other words, Maturin. Maturin was on trial for the murder of eight women in just over one month during the autumn of 1984. The details of the slayings were shocking, even to Maturin's defense lawyer, Michel Arnaud. The photos and pictures were awful. It was difficult, very difficult. I must admit that when I studied the case files, I made sure that I didn't... I didn't have lunch. I didn't have dinner. I couldn't. I couldn't. The killings always followed the same horrific ritual. Thierry Paulin les, les poussait dans l'appartement en leur tenant la bouche. Thierry Paulin pushed them into the flat, holding their mouths. Jean Thierry Maturin closed the door. And from that moment on, Thierry Paulin hit them to get them to tell them where the money was. Jean Thierry Maturin went to look for electrical cables to tie them up, so Thierry Paulin could tie them up. He went to search the flat. If the victim revealed where the money was, Jean Thierry Maturin went to check if it was there. And in the meantime, Thierry Paulin became incensed and ended up strangling them. This killer's story begins over 50 years ago. Thierry Paulin was born in the former French colony of Martinique in the Caribbean on the 28th of November 1963. His teenage parents split up within days of his birth. His uh, father abandoned he and his mother pretty shortly after his birth and went to France. Thierry remained in Martinique and was effectively brought up by his paternal grandmother, who uh, owned a restaurant and apparently neglected him. He made an attempt to go back to live with his mother, who by this point had remarried and had another family, but he didn't fit in incredibly well with that. In fact, he was a troubled young man. This is a young lad who's being passed from pillar to post. He doesn't have a lot of stability, he doesn't have a lot of routine, and life is quite chaotic. He's somebody who finds that, that he never settles in anywhere, and he never really has a, a sense of belonging. After moving to France, Paulin joined the army, 
but he was reportedly picked on for being of mixed race and a homosexual. In 1984, the 21-year-old moved to Paris. When he left the army, he went to live with his mother and he, he got a job at a, an entertainment venue that had a reputation for transvestite performers. And he, he joined in with this. I think this was uh, the first time in his life when he really felt a, a sense of belonging. And Thierry was homosexual and he developed a, a relationship with, with a man he met uh, at this place. Paulin's new lover was 19-year-old Jean-Thierry Maturin. The like-minded couple had aspirations of performing on the stage, and they also shared a passion for dressing in drag. I think if we look at his relationship, being homosexual in France at this time still carried quite a, a significant degree of, of social stigma. So even though he's found his, his place in the world, other people are still judging him, and I think that's something that is always going to trouble him. The couple began living together in a hotel called the Laval. The flamboyant pair had become addicted to drugs and weren't living within their means. It was the world of nightlife. They were invited to all the big Parisian parties. They were transvestites, people who loved to dress up. So they put on a real show. I think they really loved each other. I think there was real love there. But as part of that, Paulin dominated his partner which explains a lot the influence in Maturin was under. He existed through Paulin. Obviously, I didn't see them in their everyday lives. I didn't see them living together. I didn't see them laughing. I didn't see them in their most intimate moments. But I think it's clear that Paulin dominated Maturin and gave him the drugs he needed. As so often in life, and that's also true for criminals, there was a strong one and a weak one in this couple. And the weak one was dragged into a life of crime by Paulin during these atrocities in 1984. That much is clear. To pay for their lavish lifestyle, Paulin, with Maturin in tow, turned to crime. Each case, the motive was straightforward, money. Maturin and Pauline wanted to have a good time. They wanted to go out, they wanted to party, they wanted to go to nightclubs, they wanted to indulge their appetite for drugs, they wanted to wear different clothes, they wanted to be acknowledged as homosexual, and they were intent on having as good a time as possible. It was a spree, without any doubt, and a spree of the most murderous kind. We had two criminals, under the influence of drugs, who were completely remorseless and were looking for money, who laid waste to the scenes of their crimes, carrying out the worst kind of atrocities on these unfortunate old ladies. The old women were coming back from either the post office or the market. They came back with food and bread, etc., and which was found scattered on the floor in the doorway. It was child's play to push open the door and enter behind them, and then to subject them to mental and physical torture. The attacks were shocking in their brutality. The killers ripped off their victims' clothes, burnt their feet, and even smashed a wine bottle over one lady's head. Another was suffocated with a mattress, and in the most extreme case, 84-year-old Alice Benaim was forced to drink cleaning fluid. Something like drain cleaner, the main effect it has on the human body is that it is corrosive. So it will cause chemical burns to the mouth, tongue, the lips, and then if it's swallowed, it will cause chemical burns in the esophagus and the stomach, can potentially cause perforations. And if the fumes get into the lungs, they can set up a chemical reaction there, causing fluid on the lung and all sorts of potentially lethal consequences. One victim was Alice Benaim. To tell them where her money was, 
Paula and Mathura forced her to drink a product used for unblocking sinks. You can only imagine the suffering to make her reveal where she had hidden her savings. One of them used to hide her savings inside her corset. She had pockets full of money. The way they made them talk was by twisting their fingers. It was to make them suffer. During this two-month spree, the horrific murders sent shockwaves across the country, especially in the Montmartre district of Paris, where the majority of the crimes had taken place. I believe that what really struck public opinion was that the killer was targeting old, vulnerable, defenseless people. I believe that's what had the biggest impact on the public. There was no comparison between one murder and the next. It was the fact that these were defenseless people who were being killed. People were stunned, asking, why don't they arrest them? The public wanted justice, but detectives were struggling to find any suspects. And the longer it went on, the fewer facts we had, because everything had been tried to find them. All of the investigations had been done from our perspective, but the luck factor was missing. You have to see that with the atrocity and repetitiveness of the crimes, as well as the fact that there were no central police files at the time, that there was a general feeling that they wouldn't be arrested, and that created a real panic amongst the public. On the 2nd of June 2010, a lone gunman embarked on a deadly killing spree that rocked the nation. Shooting many of his victims at close range, 52-year-old taxi driver Derek Bird even murdered his own brother. Bird's shooting spree effectively occupied only about 12 hours. And the impact was extraordinary because this was in the days, of course, of rolling news, of 24-hour news channels. As it unfolded and as Bird became more and more obsessed by killing anybody who came across, so it became ever more dramatic. Most of Bird's victims were completely random targets. People delivering catalogues, people taking their shopping home, people just going about their day-to-day -day business. And I think it emphasizes for me how fragile life is, especially when you encounter somebody like Derek Bird, who has nothing to lose. Derek Bird killed 12 people, injured a further 11, and then turned the gun on himself. After his death, his family released a statement to the press via the local vicar. He was a loving dad and recently became a grandfather. We would like to say that we do not know why our dad committed these horrific crimes. We are both mortified by the sad events. This killer's story begins in 1957. Derek and his twin brother were born on the 27th of November in Ennerdale Bridge, a village a few miles out of Whitehaven, to a seemingly ordinary family. The twins had an older brother, and their father worked nearby for the local council. The twins went to a school in Whitehaven. Despite being older by only five minutes, Derek seemed to be in the shadow of his younger twin brother, David. It's always assumed, isn't it, that twins will adore each other. You know, there are many twins that are like that, but in this particular case, I don't think they were. I think they were rather isolated from one another. David was probably the more likable one, Derek the quieter one. He was kind of a bit of a loner. As the brothers grew up, the differences between them became more apparent. David was his twin brother, but that was where any resemblance ended, I think. Um, David was better at sports. He was on the rugby team at school. Derek wasn't a particularly athletic child. 
David was cleverer, he was more handsome, he was more successful. And many people have described Derek as living in David's shadow. And this isn't anything unusual. Many siblings are outshone by, by others in their family, but they, they don't carry the, the kind of rage and the kind of resentments that Derek Bird did. I think because that was what his personality was, he really did catastrophize this relationship with his brother and he blamed him for so many things. Despite their differences, the twins shared their father's passion for hunting game. And just before his 17th birthday, Derek was granted a shotgun license. His father was involved in guns. In small towns in the countryside of England, owning weapons, is, especially a shotgun uh, for hunting, um, is not unusual. Bird's passion for guns continued into adulthood. Bird loved shooting. It was very much a solitary pursuit. He had very little in common with his fellow taxi drivers in Whitehaven. In February 2008, his taxi was vandalized and he suspected one of them. There is often quite a bit of banter between taxi drivers, and, and sometimes this can turn quite nasty, especially when there are disputes over fares, whether somebody has picked up somebody else's passenger, because this is how these guys make their living. But for Derek Bird, he attaches an awful lot of significance to this because he has this permanent exclusion narrative. Everybody is out to get me. Everybody is against me. And I think this does add to that. Money was tight for Bird, and he became increasingly paranoid about it. When Derek Bird's father had died, there was an argument about the will and who was to get what in the will. Bird felt that his twin brother and the family solicitor were planning to reveal to the tax authorities who were examining Bird's affairs at that time that he had a secret bank account in which there was £60,000. He was convinced that the world, his brother, his solicitor, and every other taxi driver was against him. And then added on top of that, a little fuel that everyone was against him. Bird also discovered that his father had lent his twin brother David money before he died. Derek found out that his father made uh, an unspoken secret loan to David. Even at the point where he's the person, you know, taking over and being responsible for the welfare of his mother, David is getting the money, feeling disinherited and, and believing, as he did, that his, his brother and his, and his accountants were plotting against him to get him jailed for tax fraud were just too much for him. He was of the view that his brother and his solicitor had conspired against him. He felt very bitter about a £25,000 loan that his father had made to his twin brother back in 1998. So this is somebody who really does hang on to grudges. He collects them, he stores them away. He doesn't deal with those, those issues, with that anger. And it all boils and boils and boils away. He was a man who was rapidly going nowhere, was finding himself uh, alone, the frustration was simply too much for him. Alienated from everyone and increasingly annoyed that his twin brother may have benefited from his father's death, Derek Bird had finally had enough and came to a fateful decision. Full of rage and armed with his rifle, in the early hours of June the 2nd, he drove to his brother's house in Lamplu. Derek Bird arrives in his brother David's house with his silenced 22 caliber rifle and confronts him sometime in the early hours. I can only imagine the brother would have been utterly bewildered. Suddenly his brother appears in the middle of the night, wakes him up. Bird proceeds without any warning to shoot his brother not once or twice, but 11 times in the head and the body. This was a really, really cowardly act. He's caught his brother at the time when he's most vulnerable. It wasn't just an intention to kill, it was an intention to completely destroy. 
after shooting somebody 11 times, that's way more violence than you need to get the job done. So I think this does show the intensity of the resentment that Bird felt towards his brother. For him, it was a cathartic release. Remember, this isn't just a brother from his point of view that cheated him out of some inheritance, you know, late in life. This is a brother who was the person to whom he was compared for his whole life and compared unfavorably. So this was the final act of justice from his point of view. Having shot his twin brother dead, Derek Bird then left David's house and made his way to the home of 60-year-old Kevin Commons. Just after five o'clock that morning, Derek Bird drives to the house of his solicitor, Kevin Commons, and he hangs around waiting for him for around about four hours. So for me, this is really significant because it's showing that, that Bird has a rage that is not dissipating. I think when most people are angry and they don't have an outlet for that anger, it does fizzle away and people calm down, people feel better, but not Derek Bird. Several dog walkers saw Bird outside Kevin Commons' farmhouse in the village of Frizzington. He waited there for several hours, planning his next deadly move. Around about 10 o'clock that morning, Kevin Commons drives up his driveway, sees Derek Bird blocking him in and probably wonders what on earth is going on. He's not given long to process that thinking until Bird comes out and shoots him twice. He must be absolutely shocked. You know, what on earth is he doing? Um, so, so he's just basically trying to survive at this point in time. He, he hasn't killed him. So he, he stumbles to his feet. He starts to, to crawl away to go back towards his house. A neighbor heard the gunshots and saw Kevin Commons trying to flee. Bird follows him, but replaces the shotgun with the rifle and proceeds to shoot him twice more killing him at the spot. Just after 10 a.m., the concerned neighbors called the police who discovered Kevin's body in his driveway. But Bird was nowhere to be seen. He'd fled the scene in his car, armed with two weapons, a 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle. Shotguns and rifles are very different weapons. A rifle is designed to send a stable projectile a long distance. A shotgun is designed to spread pellets out. A rifle certainly can fire a small projectile that can kill you, but at short range, the mass of pellets can produce utterly devastating injuries. With greater range, less effective, but close up, a shotgun is far more deadly. Derek Bird had killed two innocent men, his twin brother David and 60-year-old family solicitor Kevin Commons. Then, at approximately 1.30 p.m., police officers found Derek Bird's body in a wooded area near Boot. He'd shot himself. He'd engaged in the ultimate failure act. There was no reason for him to be here anymore. He's got nothing left to lose at this point in time, and spree killers will often take their own lives. And what this represents is a way of taking back control. So they are the ones who are making the final decision on when it is they die. They don't want to go to prison. They don't want to have to face the consequences of their actions. So they take that very calculated decision to kill themselves. Stephen Greveson was born in Sunderland on the 14th of December 1970. He grew up in a large family and his parents were reportedly violent towards one another. You are molded by the environment you live in. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, everybody knows this. So if you grow up with violence, you tend to be more violent than people that don't. Greveson appears to show some psychopathic traits in childhood. Some of his old school reports are looked at by a psychologist at his trial. And within these reports, they talk of his lack of empathy, about his callousness, about his real lack of emotion towards other people. 
I think there are a few red flags in Stephen Greaveson's childhood, but they're not necessarily red flags that say to me, this person's going to turn into a murderer. They're red flags that say, this is somebody who perhaps needs some help, needs some support, you know, later on in childhood and, and in their teenage years. Growing up, Greaveson was often in trouble. And in 1982, he was arrested for shoplifting. He opened a, a packet of nails inside a, a shop. He didn't take the whole pack. He took one nail and he got caught. Um, and obviously the owner of the shop didn't like that very much. And he actually went to court for stealing one nail. <laughs> one nail, not a pack of nails, one nail. But he was only 11 years old. Extraordinarily, he was taken in front of the magistrate. Now, for most 11-year-old boys, that would be the most terrifying experience imaginable. And they would certainly not dream of doing it again, even though it was, in many ways, absolutely irrelevant, tiny crime, certainly not punishable by anything significant. But it's interesting that Greaveson didn't take that experience as any kind of lesson. He simply brushed it off, water off a duck's back. He simply went on and did what he wanted to do. At the age of 13, social services made the decision to remove Greveson from the family home. Well, when he was an adolescent, he was taken into the residential care system and he ends up at a children's home in Carlisle. Greveson's troubles continued through his adolescence. In May of the same year, 1990, Sunderland was rocked by the murder of a 14-year-old boy called Simon Martin. He'd been found semi-naked and bludgeoned to death in a derelict building after running away from home just days before. I remember the Simon Martin murder very well. Um, we had five murders in less than a week in Sunderland. And in hindsight, looking back, whether that was putting extra pressure on the police with a given murder inquiry involving 40, 50, police officers, a hell of a lot of police resources, and whether that would have put strain um, on the, the Simon Martin murder at the time. The police initially thought they had quickly solved the crime after arresting a local teenager. He was 16, he lived nearby. Um, he was a respectable lad from a good family from memory, and he'd been playing in that building uh, with others, and they found his fingerprints in the building. Uh, there was blood in the building as well, and they found his fingerprint in blood, which was just coincidence. All charges against the 16-year-old boy would eventually dropped. The murder of Simon Martin would remain unsolved for 23 years. But during the original investigation in May 1990, police had also spoken to a local 19-year-old man named Stephen Greveson. He's somebody who had a reputation in the local area for hanging around with, with people younger than him. And I think when you've got somebody who's trying to, to get a sense of control, get a sense of power, you often feel that they hang around with people who they see as slightly inferior to them. Greveson was questioned by the police in the wake of Simon Martin's body being discovered. And Greveson said, yes, I certainly I saw him, but he was fine when I left him. Greveson was released without charge. Three years later, the discovery of the body of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly would trigger a series of similar deaths that would spread fear across the whole of Sunderland. By the winter of 1993, 22-year-old Stephen Greveson had built up a reputation as a troublemaker. In November of the same year, Thomas Kelly, an 18-year-old student, had gone missing from the family home he shared with his parents and his sister, Lindsay. My brother Thomas was just a normal boy for the time, just kind, helpful. He would do anything for anybody. Loved life. We wouldn't go to bed on a night time without saying we loved each other. He used to call me Pins instead of Linds. <laughs> <laughs> which was a bit strange, but uh, that was the way we went on. We argued quite a bit, as brother and sister do, but never went to bed without making up. We were very close as brother and sister. We were close as a family. We didn't have loads of money or nothing like that, but we, we went out and done things together. 
silly things like Willie picking and, you know, we're just a very close family, I'd say. Lindsay vividly remembers the day her older brother disappeared. I went to school, me mum went to work and then Thomas had left for college. And that was the last time we'd seen, seen him. It was actually a bit strange that morning because we were very close as brother and sister. But that morning he was standing by the fireplace in my mum's house and um, as we said bye, he walked forward and grabbed my hand and squeezed my hand. On November the 26th, 1993, the emergency services were called to a burning shed on an allotment near Monk Wearmouth Hospital in Sunderland. The fire attracts attention inevitably, and the body of Thomas Kelly is found. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for whoever arrived on that allotment to confront the sight of a, a burning body in a burning building. It is gruesome. When I came on the news, I wasn't listening to the news, and I'd, I was sitting in the house, and I'd seen my dad cover his face, and I went, what's wrong? And he went, there's a body being found. And they say parents get a feeling. I don't know where they go feeling at that point. Thomas's badly burned body had seemingly destroyed any possible evidence, and senior detectives at Northumbria Police were not convinced that he had been murdered. Detective Wilson was certain that all three deaths were linked. Not only were the crime scenes extremely similar, all three boys had attended the same school, Monk Wearmouth Comprehensive. In August 1994, Wilson asked for a second post-mortem to be carried out on all the bodies by a senior pathologist. You don't just call a friend and say, oh, can you re-examine the body? No, you have to get, you know, court orders and judges and everybody involved. And this detective was relentless. He went after it and he got the court order that was needed. This is a detective that he knew that something was wrong. You know, when you read a case and, and you just, you, maybe it's a gut feeling or there's something there, you go, okay, this cannot be like this. On closer inspection, all three teenagers appeared to have died in the same way. So in Graveson's case, the most important factor was that the ligature marks are then identified. We're now moving from three similar but apparently discrete incidents, albeit involving three young boys from the same school, to three potential homicides from the same school the same way. Now you're almost looking towards a serial killer. I think that the fact that Stephen Greveson killed his victims via strangulation is very significant because it's one of the most personal forms of killing. You are watching the life drain out of them. He's probably feeling more in control at the time he's killing his victims than he's ever felt at any point in his life before. So I think it's a very deliberate choice of method. I think they were groomed, encouraged, cajoled, or perhaps even threatened by Greveson and they paid the price with their lives. I remember the day very well. I was on The Sun when um, Northumbria Police uh, revealed that they were treating the deaths as murder. Um, and tragic as it was, the family would have seen that as a victory, um, that finally something was happening. Detectives had found fingerprints and a footprint belonging to Greveson in the derelict house where David Hansen was murdered. They were from a burglary Greveson had committed months before, but proved he had access to the property. And by September 1994, Wilson had retrieved some conclusive evidence. Seaman found in the stomach of the third victim, 15-year-old David Grief, was a DNA match for Stephen Greveson. If you burn the outside of the body, then you can lose injuries. If you lose the skin and the soft tissues beneath it, there's going to be less and less that you can see. 
but it can be surprising what you can still identify, particularly if the area is protected from the fire. You can still see maybe stab wounds. You can see all sorts of things that many people who try to dispose of a body by fire think will be gone. Greveson was already in prison for robbery after holding up a fish and chip shop. Stephen Greveson was a bully. He wasn't nice. He used to go around picking on lads and taking stuff off them. He picked on teenage boys, old women, anybody that was smaller than him, I think. He was a troublemaker, someone to keep away from. When Greveson was arrested for the murder, we weren't shocked at all, because it was what we were fighting for, for months. We knew it was him. We knew that those boys had done nothing wrong. We knew that someone had done that to them.